Hello and welcome to the final Tennis Menu Daily US Open show. Val Febo here with you. What a day it was. We are here for the tennismenu.com. Everything you need to know about tennis. And we think Dominic Team and Alexander Zverev might need to get back on there and, uh, and have a look at some of, the, uh, some of the techniques that they were using this morning because they were both absolutely exhausted by the end of it. And Mark Sapoulis, the best high-performance coach uh, in the business, is here with me. Mark. How are you, mate? That that was um, I, I'm I'm exhausted. I can't even get my words out in this intro. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Yeah. Team wins in five. We'll go through it in depth. But first things first. How are you? Oh, that was an epic match. I mean, it was some of the most unbelievable tennis from Zverev in those first two sets, uh, where I just did not expect that to happen. He played average all tournament, um, and comes out and plays the way he did in the first two sets. And for Dominic Team to be able to flip that around. Um, and then we, we'll go in more depth, but he's flipped it around like you wouldn't believe and get to the fifth set and Zverev even serves for the match at 5-3 and then Dominic Team has two match points and it, oh, it was just uh, one of the most amazing matches I've seen in a long time and, you know, at the end of the match, just seeing Zverev break down just shows how much it meant to him and, you know, what a, what a tough way to lose your first ever Grand Slam final um, to, to go out the way he did and, you know, for Dominic Team, it's fourth time lucky. Um, yep. You know, so unbelievable. It's just it's been a long morning, um, and you know, one that I'll definitely never forget. No, exactly right. And the scoreline for those who haven't seen it is uh, Team over Zverev two six four six six four six three seven six. And um, the first man in since uh, who was it? It was uh, Pancho Gonzalez in 1949 to win the U.S. Open in uh, coming back from two sets to love down. But the thing is, it wasn't even called the US Open back then. So uh, first time in history that it's pretty much happened and first time since uh, Gaston Gaudio did it against Guillermo Correa in 2004 at the French Open. But he was down two sets to love. Zverev breaks in the third. Zverev down, then team somehow gets back. And oh, look, I will claim this because I text you after the second <laughs> set and I said, team's going to win this. You did. You did. He's going to win this. Yep. And I almost second guessed myself many times, but um, <laughs> yeah, he was down a break in the third, won that, won the fourth pretty convincingly. The fifth, he breaks in the first game. Then Zverev breaks back immediately. Then Zverev gets to a 5 3 lead, serves for it. Gets broken. <laughs> Team breaks for 6-5. Serves for it. Gets broken. We get to the tie break. Zverev gets a mini break. <laughs> Team comes back. <laughs> Team gets to 6-4. Two match points. Misses two forehands. Zverev gets it back to 6-all. Team wins 8-6 in the fifth. Zverev didn't even have a match point in amongst all this madness. It was just one of the most crazy matches I've ever seen. Mark, how as a coach... And we saw Nicholas Masu just look completely helpless there in Dominic Team's corner, <laughs> trying to will him on. But oh. you, can't, you can't say anything really in these situations, can you? You, you can't do a thing. And Nicholas Masu, aka John Travolta in Face Off, was absolutely <laughs> going off his tree. He was standing up and he was like pumping his fist. And uh, I, I literally, I kept getting um, John Travolta lookalikes and doing a side by side on Instagram. But I thought it was quite interesting to watch, like. He was just riding every wave with uh, Dominic team and flip side to, to Zverev's team. And they were just sitting there and nicely clapping and being nice and calm and trying to keep him composed. And yeah, I thought it was uh, yeah an amazing, amazing battle and a battle that you wish they could have just sort of spent the time just hugging each other at the net, like in like a normal situation, because it was, it just deserved to be, um, it, it deserved to be one of those matches where a crowd was at. It deserved to be a match where, you know, everyone was able to to applaud both players and the work they put in. Dominic Team went 6-5 up in that last set and called the trainer. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing, my friend? I know. What are you doing? You know, you've got momentum. But he was sore. He was really sore. He, he was tight in the adductor. He was tight in the hamstring. His foot, which had been playing up for the last two matches, really was hurting him. Now, that remains to be seen whether or not he actually goes and plays the French Open now after all these, you know, winning a slam and feeling the way he does. Can he back that up? He's already pulled out of Rome, apparently. Um, yeah. 
you know, whether or not Zverev does as well. I mean, seven days' time, they're going to back up and play the French Open. Uh, you know, it's just and on cl- clay's the most brutal surface. Incredible. Like, it, just the way that, uh, you know, this has panned out. And obviously, no fault of anybody's, but this pandemic has really thrown things into disarray. But um, fantastic men's final. I thought, you know, this was going to be a, a whitewash, and we did predict that Dominic team would probably walk through this match, but he didn't. And, and credit to, to Zverev. I, I, you know, I, I probably underestimated him. He played unbelievable in that match. Served 15 double faults, which really hurt him in the long run. We yep. did say it could be his, his Achilles heel today, and it ended up being probably a little bit of that. Plus, he got a little bit tired and, uh, and just couldn't get over the line. Yeah, well, I think in, that's what we're going to get into now. And 15 aces, but 15 double faults. But Dominic team, eight aces, eight double faults. Yeah. So they both hit the exact same amount of aces and double faults. Yeah. And then you look at who said you can't win a Grand Slam under 50% on uh, winning on your second serve. Dominic team, 48%. Alexander Zverev, 41% winning on their second serve. The net points was impressive. Zverev coming into the net 66 times. He's had a lot of issues at the net in his career. Came in a lot. Team only came in 31 times. Um, Zverev really tried to make team pass him. And the backhand pass wasn't really working for team. But one thing that I need to ask you about, because it was doing my head in the entire match, team kept hitting a slice to Alexander Zverev's forehand. And he kept hitting that backhand slice, nice and easy, juicy for Zverev. And he kept putting it away. And it happened time and time again. Yes, Zverev's uh, forehand has been nervous when he's been tight and when it's been in a high pressure situation but when you're when it keeps happening to you and it's happened it probably happened about 20 or 30 times today was very put him away with it either a winner or a forced error why did team keep doing it i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about this i think there's a really good point and you brought up the first point which was net net points i don't i don't ever think that Alexander Zverev is coming 66 times in his entire career let alone in one match now to me, this was the ploy from the start. Zverev wanted to hold his baseline. Zverev wanted to take control of the points and keep team back. Now, when team is back, the ball has more lift because he needs to get more depth. Zverev pounced and took control of that. As you saw the match go on, he was approaching to the Zverev backhand, uh, sorry, to the team backhand and broke it down. Team really struggled to pass him off the backhand side which really surprised me because in the last set, Zverev approached three times in a row to the team's forehand and got passed three times in a row. Now, I feel he got broken down. Now, he won't say it. He won't ever come out and record and say it, but he lost his total confidence in his top spin backhand. Absolute total yeah. confidence. He could not play. He didn't want to play backhand. He wanted to slice. He wanted to keep the ball in play. You cannot slice to, to Alexander Zverev because he has... Uh, a flatter base grip, and he wants that ball right in that strike zone. You yeah. can't give him that ball, and he kept giving him that ball. So, for me, it was a bit of a double-edged sword there. He was, like, being pressured so much by his very of coming in that he just lost total confidence. And that was the the total the total match there. And then to watch Zverev come in, absolutely outstanding. He, his winning re- record at the net today was 65%. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant ploy, but I felt towards the end, he just stopped, oh, well, probably that last set or the last two sets, he stopped pressuring. And yeah. Dominic team stepped up to the baseline, started controlling the points more. Yeah. And as soon as he controlled the points more, the match flipped. And that's where probably Zverev needed to keep going and doing what he was doing. Yep. And that's where Zverev kept hitting the approaches to team's backhand because he made him make those backhand passes. More often than not, they didn't come off. Yep. But when the forehand pass came, as you mentioned... He hit those three, and I'm going to say it, Mark, orgasmic, <laughs> orgasmic winners. Because I was messaging you, I was messaging Joel Frucci and, and a lot of other people, and we all just went up yeah. when those shots went, went through. Like on Twitter, Twitter just erupted. It was just, it was amazing. It was, it was. they were seriously just. It was. It was. And, you know, like watching... Watching that cat and, cat and mouse game, and, and that's what, tennis is a game of chess. You know, one player makes a move, the other person sort of tries to counter yeah. that and vice versa. And, and the way that Zverev went out and just went aggressive, take control of the points, step up the court, he couldn't be nervous in those first two sets. He came out as the underdog, and that's one of the biggest things. Zverev was an underdog for one of the first times in this tournament. Therefore, he had nothing to lose a little bit in the first two sets. As soon as he was two sets to love up, it was like, oh, hang on a second. Um, uh, I'm in the <laughs> I'm box. I'm the favourite now. I'm the favourite. 
he pulled back and Dominic Team went back up and, and started to play as the underdog. And it was just interesting from a mindset perspective that cat and mouse game was really, really interesting to watch. And at the end of the day, obviously, you know, what it was in the end, I think it was four points separated the match. So yep. it could have gone either way. Four points separated the match. Zverev covered 5,137 metres. Team, 5,206. So only 69 difference there. And then distance covered per point, 16.2 metres for team, 16.0 for Zverev. So it was on a knife's edge the entire time. But even the commentators were saying, who's it harder for either player? Is it easier to come back from behind or come back from in front? Because And, and yeah. I don't think they could have summed it up any better because neither player, when leading, could hold on. Yeah, it's interesting when you play in a situation where you've actually got nothing to lose. Now, I know there's a grand slam on the, on the, on. Uh, here and, and you can lose a grand slam but when you start off a match as the underdog as Vera did he literally just played like an underdog he played like nothing to lose he was free he was relaxed everything was swinging um, and then as soon as it got to the point where it was a bit tight he tightened up he pulled back and then Dominic Team played the other way he was like swinging and relaxed and loose and everything was going really well and it's the battle of the mindset you know you've, you're not playing just an opponent you're playing yourself and if you can get out of your own way to me, that's the most important part in a Grand Slam. If you can get out of your own way, because there's so many factors riding on you playing loosely, from uh, pressure to money to crowd to um, you know results to whatever it is. It's, there's uh, so many things that, that create pressure. And you saw Zverev play in those last three sets like the, like there was a you know a weight on his shoulders, and there was um, you know whereas in the first two sets he was free as a bird. So yeah, it was a great match to watch, and you know one of those matches that you just go, wow, I'm glad I got up at five o'clock in the morning and made sure I, I switched on ready for it. Yeah, no, I'm uh, as we said yesterday, I'm not a morning person, so that was extremely difficult for me, especially idiot me stayed up so late watching Formula One. <laughs> Tennis the priority, Val. Come on. Yes. Um, but. Looking at that, now, there's two things I want to bring up. So Zverev's speech at the end, he, he was just gutted. But I did love the handshake between the two. It was like that you could tell that they're very close. But Zverev was just absolutely gutted. And he was just motionless, just sat there staring blankly into the into Arthur Ashe Stadium, the empty stands. And he went up and just lost it in his speech. And I thought it was really, um, I thought it was really moving and I, I was heartbroken for him. And it's a match that you wish there, there was a draw really. Yeah. And, and that's the worst thing about sport, isn't it? There's mm. going to be a winner and there's a loser. And at the end of the day, someone has to win the match. And, you know, team's been on that, that side of the fence three times already. And, uh, you know, for him to win that, it's a great feeling for him. Obviously he was elated but, yeah, you think about the player who loses the match and how much that affects them moving forward or it affects them in one way or the other. They're either going to go and just think, you know, I gave, gave everything and I, can't, I couldn't do it, or it's like, wow, I'm so close. You know, and you look at it in two different ways. And, you know, he was gutted. His speech, he cried. He just couldn't stop. Um, and you really feel that emotion come out. And, and it is an emotional game. It's, it's tough because at the end of the day, you're out there on your own playing. And you've got no one there and no one could console him in those, in those moments. But, um, you know, credit to both players. They're, both, they're actually both players that, that highlight what this game's all about. Sportsmanship, competitiveness uh, and real true grit today. It was, a, it was a good final to finish on. It definitely wasn't. Mark, I want to I wanna give you a little bit of trivia. So back in 2011, Dominic Team played his first ever ATP Tour match. Uh, it was in Vienna. And, or he won his first ATP Tour match. Can you tell me who he beat that night? There's a little bit of irony to this, so I want to know if you get it. To be honest, mate, I have just zero idea. Zero idea. Okay. It was one Thomas Muster. So Muster made a, a comeback to tennis and came out of retirement. Not sure why. Didn't really do too much for the year that he was on the tour. Came back was ranked 1,078 and team was at that point, I think, 17, 18 years old. And came out, beat Musta 6-2, 6-3 for his first ever ATP win. Since then, Musta was Austria's only Grand Slam champion before that. And now team has joined him as Austria's right. second. And I love that, that it was that night in Vienna was essentially the changing of the guard between Austria's former champion. And yes, they've had Jürgen Meltzer and other players, but the future champion in Dominic Team being the Grand Slam. And I really love that. 
that little story arc that wow. team has finally got there and um, achieved his dream. And it, it's amazing to see after, you know, three failed finals where he's progressively gotten better, three sets, four sets, five sets. Now he's won one. So, you know, perseverance. He said he was going to have to ring Andy Murray if, um, if he lost it. <laughs> and um, Andy would have had a few tips because he won it on the fifth try. So, yeah, that, it was just, it's a brilliant narrative, I think, for, for the men's game. And the French Open was always the one that I thought he would win first if, if there was one. I didn't know if he'd actually win another one. I thought it would only be the French. But I, I, I'm really, really impressed with what Dominic team has done. And Nicolas Massou joined him in February 2019. A month later, he was a Masters 1000 champion on hard court. Yeah. And since then, he has not looked back, and I'm really impressed. Yeah, he's, he's done an amazing job. And as you said, taking over from Thomas Muster, who was, you know, must be something in Austria because they're pretty gritty over there. And obviously, the, the story behind Thomas Muster was how he broke his leg in a uh, car accident and came back and became world number one after that. And the, the vision of him hitting in a, in a wheelchair, especially made wheelchair on a brick wall, is, a, is one that I'll never forget. And it's an incredible story with Thomas Muster. But to see Dominic Team go out there today um, and show the same grit and determination that Thomas Muster will be probably really proud of as a, you know, a fellow Austrian and, and uh, Grand Slam champion, I think is, is incredible. And, you know, whether or not this is something to propel him up to the next level and give him that belief that he, he belongs at the level, remains to be seen I think uh, we did talk about whether or not you know why these two probably haven't won slams in the past and their first two sets was pretty ordinary watching you know both of them you know a bit shaky a bit nervous um but you know they they both show that they do belong at the level they both played an amazing sort of match and you know you can look back on it and say they were both just so nervous because of their you know trying to win their first slam without the big three there it's almost like you know they were, they were trying to to change the guard over in that respect as well and they felt the pressure and they really did. But uh, wow, what a what a final and uh, and well done, Dominic team. And you know, hats off to you because uh, you know he's 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 deserved it. Three final losses, you know, and, and to be able to come through today shows perseverance and uh, resilience and shows really good character. Yep, I agree. And yeah, it was. It was absolutely phenomenal and it was an exhausting match and it looked as though at one point neither player actually did want it um, in the yeah, end. But, right. um, no, it was just, it, it was unbelievable. And I think just looking back on it, I don't think it's anything we'll ever forget. The 2020 US Open, we've had a women's final that's gone the distance. The men's final, first ever um, US Open final that's ever been decided by a fifth set tiebreak. We've had two out of the last four slams and I'm still going to go with this, that fifth set tiebreaks suck. Mm. I can't stand them. Like, look, maybe, maybe in a, maybe from first round to the semifinals, have it. But for a Grand Slam final to be decided by a tiebreak, I just, I can't have that. Yeah. Well, here's a question for you: Who wins that match if that match isn't a fifth set tiebreak? I don't, I don't know. I think maybe he's very. Team I would, I would that, go the same. Yeah. Team looked that shaky on serve. And how many serves would he have been able to sustain in a service game if he this, got the moment? Yeah. Because he couldn't serve properly at the end. Uh, it was it was at a point where he was like, I can't serve, I can't serve, I can't serve. Oh, yeah. I just won at 136. Yeah, yeah. But, he was cooked. He was absolutely cooked. He was sore. Yeah, I would I'd probably go spare, but yeah, I mean, uh, hindsight's yeah. beautiful and uh, different exactly. rules. And interesting. Same with and that's the thing. I think the fifth set tiebreak has actually caused a different winner in the last two because I bet you my house, Federer would have beaten Djokovic if it wasn't for that fifth set tiebreak in Wimbledon last year. And Zverev would have won today. Yep, yep. So, I don't, let's not talk about Wimbledon 2019. because. <laughs> oh, that's look, I think, you know, overall, this US Open has been absolutely outstanding. You know, you look at um, how it probably started. We probably put an asterisk next to the name of the winner. We finish off going, wow, that was incredible. And, you know, three mums in the semifinal of the women's side, uh, women's draw uh, was incredible to watch. Pironkova, Serena Williams, Azarenka, all getting through those matches. Um, you know, you, you watch uh, Osaka win her third Grand Slam at the age of 22 is incredible. Does she then go on and do more? Um, you look at the Novak Djokovic default, you know, that's going to be talked about forever and forever yep. a day. 
the players that didn't come, you know, how many players didn't turn up, the bubble, you know, totally different situation, you know, reduced amount of players and, and staff that were able to go, you know, more um, Hawkeye, you know, on, on all the courts apart from one. Yeah. It was just absolutely incredible that you think about it. Grand Slam was run the way that it was and the success that it had. I'm going to look back on this and go, well, wow, it's, it's been amazing. I mean, 2020 has been a hell of a year. Um, I, I just can't wait for it to be over. Let's fast forward and fast fast track to 2021, but to look back now and to go, well, we never thought this was going to be possible. And to, to see the results, to see the level of tennis that was played, to see a new Grand Slam champion on the men's side, to see a, a promising uh, champion on the women's side that could go on forever. Val Febo, mate, I have literally enjoyed every moment of this US Open. Yeah, it's been amazing. And there's no asterisk at all. And it stayed relatively COVID-free. Benoit Pair, the enigmatic Frenchman. Of course, Benoit got it of all people um it's just such a benoit thing to happen i guess um <laughs> with, with him getting covid but no it was um we hope he's okay but no it has been a fantastic us open it's been probably my favorite us open in a very very long time um there yeah. haven't been this many narratives to emerge from a us open in such a while and i think it's been absolutely fantastic that we've seen um we, we've seen this happen but now the, the fun stuff, Mark. We've analysed the tournament. The tournament's done. Now, like we did yesterday with the women, let's go through and see who we think out of the men's game could hoist from the big three and still win some slams and win slams in the rankings at the moment. And just quickly, can Dominic Team finish the year at world number one? He'll be 1,700 points behind Novak. Can he finish the year as number one? No. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. I don't, don't have to give me any on. reason. He's one, yeah. 1,700 with this fixed ranking system is pretty difficult to overcome. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's going to be very tough. good finish to last. It's going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, agree. All right. The rankings. Well, I know this is going to be a big yes. Djokovic. Yeah. <laughs> He's done. Unless he gets defaulted from the French as well. <laughs> going to happen. Carreño Busta. Actually, Carreño Busta. Gets a bye through his first round of Rome this week. And guess who he has to face first? Nadal. Rafa. Yep. <laughs> wow. Oh, you can't write scripts like that. <laughs> Nadal, can he still win slams? Yes. Agree. Team, well, he's just won one. So, yes. yes. Roger? Yes. Yep, I think so too. Um, Medvedev? Yes. Yep. Tsitsipas? Yes. Zverev? Yes. Now it gets interesting. Matteo Berrettini? No. I'm in your camp there. Gal Monfi had a very good start to the year and was the only one to really push Novak, but can he win a slam? You know what? He's got the game to win it. Does he have the consistency to do it? I'm not too sure. He's coached by a brilliant coach, Liam Smith. Our outstanding coach has taken him to new levels and, and congratulations to Liam on, on what he's done with uh, Gal Monfi. But um, I'm going to say probably going to fall slightly short. I think so as well. What exactly has he done with Monfi that you've noticed that he's sort of that he's made him more consistent? I, I just think the, maybe it's to do with his off court stuff. It looks like he's more settled off court. It looks like he's more controlled off court. It looks like he's got more consistency in what he's doing. He's obviously older and more mature now. Yeah. But you know, I mean, who knows behind the scenes what's actually going on? I don't want to sort of preempt it, but it looks like he's he's actually able to be more level in the way he plays and, and where that comes from. He's a, a range of things, but uh, no, Liam's done a great job with Mon yep. Gail Monfi. Yep, I agree. And even the relationship with Elena Svitolina that he's had, um, yeah. I think that definitely helps as well. Davi Goffan? No. Roberto Bautista Agu? No. Bonini? The fat no. shamer? No. <laughs> Diego Schwartzman? No. Neither. Rublev? Possibly. Yep. Stan? Can he still do it? Yes. Yep. Um, it's funny, we still keep going to these older guys and yeah. they're still the ones that we look at. Yeah. Uh, Kashinov? No. No? I reckon he might be able to in the future. Uh, Shapovalov? Possibly. I think he can. And Ranić is rounding out the top 18. I don't think Ranić can. I think and it, can. You know, I think those, those answers for me are based more on those top three players not being there. And I think at, once those three players are gone... The, the possibilities open up a little bit more. Right now, I can't see too many guys beating those top three. No. Not right now. But, you know, I think there'll be a changing in the guard at some point, and I think there's a, the, it opens up to everyone. 
Remember when we thought it would happen six years ago when Stan and Chilich won in Australia and America? <laughs> Yeah, not gonna happen too um, much. <laughs> hasn't happened at all mark what's been your favorite moment from the u.s open um your response to novak being defaulted <laughs> was my favorite part by by far but um no look i think just the two finals just showcased exactly what tennis is all about um and you know i think i think the level of play was probably far beyond what i expected coming back from covid um, you know, so many players weren't able to prepare. So many players weren't able to do what they normally do. There was not much lead up. But the level of the game was absolutely outstanding. It's a real credit to the players um, who probably were locked away for a little while doing their thing. A credit to the coaches. It's a credit to tennis to get this back to where it is. And, you know, everybody that's been involved in that has been absolutely outstanding. And, you know, a big shout out to all the coaches, especially the Australian coaches who have really struggled in Melbourne. We're really, really in a tough situation where we're still not allowed to be on court and we're still weeks away from even doing that. But, you know, to every player out there, to every coach out there, to everyone involved in tennis, well done on, you know, continually being, I guess, resilient in, in your own mindsets and staying the course because this has been a real challenge for everyone, um, including myself. And I know what it's like to, to be on the bad end of the stick because we're probably the only place in the world that can't actually go out onto a tennis court. So it has been a real challenge and, you know, well done to everyone involved. It's going to be a US Open to remember. And I'm guessing next week at the French Open, it's going to be another situation where who knows what's going to happen. But uh, yeah, it's been a, a great US Open and I'm really proud to be able to sit here and, and spend the two weeks with you dissecting the matches because it's been an absolute pleasure. It has been an absolute blast doing this show every week. And yeah, I, I think I do agree with you. The narratives of the tournament. Look, the karma bus getting Novak is pretty hard to beat um, from, a, from a moment point of view. And um, after everything he's done this year, I think it was pretty a pretty fitting way to end, I guess, for, for Novak um, being defaulted. And look, I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit, a little bit happy. Um, <laughs> but no, it was, it was a great tournament. I think the matches that we've seen were phenomenal. I think the stories coming out, a, a first-time major winner, um, a, a lot of guys really making their first major indent at a slam. You know, we had a lot of PBs, Zverev, Team, Demonor, Shapovalov. Jordan um, Thompson. Uh, yeah, Jordan Thompson as well. Mm. Um, Pablo Carreño Busta equaled his personal best. Um, Daniel Medvedev was pretty good, gave us a couple of good one-liners through the tournament as well. Yeah. Uh, Look, I'm just looking forward to starting this all again next week with, um, with the French <laughs> Open. And uh, so that is the good news. We will be back. We didn't realise it was so close. Well, I just, we were talking yesterday, Mark, and I've gone, oh, hang on, 22nd of September. It's the 13th. So, yeah, yeah. That, yeah it's French stuff next week. Wow. Um, so, look, death, taxes and Rafa winning the French, I think. And um, <laughs> that, that might be the way we're going about it. But we're very much looking forward to it. But Mark, it has been an absolute pleasure doing this show with you and I can't wait to spend another two weeks looking into your beautiful eyes and, um, and going on and going forth on the red dirt of Paris. Yeah, thanks very much, Val, for hosting and doing what you do. And, you know, thanks to those pl uh, people who have watched this show and, and given us some great feedback. You know, we hope we can make it even better for next week. And, you know, it's, it's exciting to have tennis back and exciting to, uh, to be able to watch it and, and give us something to do while we're, we're sitting at home doing nothing at all. <laughs> Exactly right. Exactly right. Mark Zafullis, thank you very much. And look, we, we want to know your thoughts as well. Anything you want to ask us for next week's show, we want to be as accessible as possible. So ask us a question, coaching, media side of things, whatever. We're happy to answer it. So send us through your questions on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. So Instagram and Twitter at The Tennis Menu or Facebook at The Tennis Menu as well. And same with LinkedIn. So if you want to send us through any questions, please do it. We're happy to answer them on the show. We love talking with the fans and with the people that have listened. We do want to thank everybody that has watched and listened to all of the waffling that Mark and I have done over this last two weeks. And we're excited to bring you more of that waffling next week. And we're going to have a lot more to talk about when the French Open comes. Remember, you can look at thetennismenu.com. Get on the packages with Shane, Lauren. Mark has done such a wonderful job coordinating all of this. Same with Nick, George, and Joel as well. So it's been absolutely fantastic. Val Febo and Mark Sapoulis have been with you, guiding you through the US Open. It's been fantastic. Naomi Osaka lifts her th third Grand Slam. Dominic Team lifts his first in an epic this morning. Can't wait for Roland Garros.